I was trying to write a book about climate change and what role an individual can play. Mm -hmm. um, an individual who is informed, like just about everybody is now. An individual who cares, like just about everybody does, but who feels lost inside of this crisis, you know, not knowing what to do with my knowledge and care. And so as I started to research, the answer was easily, quickly apparent. It's not a mystery. It's not controversial. It's not buried. It's with a Google search away. You know, what can I do to battle yeah. climate change? Um, and as it turns out, there are four things that one can do that matter more, significantly more than all others, which are to fly less, to live car free, um, have fewer children, and to eat a plant-based diet. So three of those are a little bit different than the fourth because 85% um, of Americans drive to work. I assume it's a relatively similar number here. Mm -hmm. and most of our cities have been designed to require cars at this point. The majority of flights are either for business or for non-leisure personal purposes. And the decision to have a child is just not a decision most people are making most of the time. Mm. Um, but food is a decision that we make many times each day. And the impact on the environment is not only profound, but um, sort of unique among those activities because it's the only one that addresses methane and nitrous oxide, which are the two most powerful greenhouse gases. So that was what I had to write about. If I was going to write an honest book about um, what we can do as individuals, two of the main critiques of this idea of eating less meat are one that not everyone can afford to. That's just simply untrue. It's just the opposite. It's Harvard Medical School did a study uh, in 2018 that found that it's about $750 a year cheaper to eat uh, a plant-based diet mm -hmm. or a vegetarian diet than a meat traditional diet. Um, the, on top of which, people who make less than $30,000 a year um, are two and a half times more likely to be vegetarian than people who make more than $75,000 a year and people of color are disproportionately vegetarian. So the argument that um, it costs more or is somehow elitist in that way just isn't, isn't factually correct. Mm -hmm. Other people will say, it takes more time. And like, I have so many things on my mind, how am I gonna also think about that? That I actually agree with. It does take more time, at least in the beginning, mm -hmm. because we're so used to eating in a certain way. Mm -hmm. You know, we have habits. You go to the grocery store, you buy these things without thinking, you bring them home. For most people, it's like, some form of protein that you just broil or fry or whatever, and maybe a vegetable or two on the side, and that's it. Uh, for me, even going from a vegetarian diet to a plant-based diet has required thought and time and research. Um, I have found that I, while that has been frustrating sometimes, or just a pain, I'm glad to spend my time in that way. It feels like a good way to spend time I'm very often doing it with others, mm -hmm. with people that I care about. I like preparing food for others. I like meals being like conscientious acts, deliberate acts. You know, in America, one out of three people eat a meal every day in a fast food chain, and one out of every five meals is eaten in a car. It's just it's not good. It's not good for us. Mm. It's, we know it's bad for our bodies. Mm -hmm. We know it's bad for the environment, but it, it's also bad for... Um, whatever you might refer to as a soul. You know, it's, it's bad for our psychological well-being to think of food like that and to experience food like that. Mm. And it's a rich experience to, you know, move through a supermarket or even better, a farmer's market. And really, like, give thought to what's available and what you want and to go home and to cook something over time, maybe with music playing or while conversing with a loved one and then to eat a meal at a table. Yes, these things take time. Yes, people have a shortage of time or believe they do. Mm. And there's certainly some people who have no time at all because they have two or three jobs. We can't all change in the same ways and at the same pace. Um, somebody who has three jobs is clearly not going to be able to devote as much time to food as somebody who has one job. Um, and we can't expect somebody who lives in an urban food desert without any access to fresh food to make a change at all. It would be unfair to mm. ask that of a person. I'm very lucky. I have one job, two jobs. I teach and I'm a writer. Um, and 
I have found that I can actually spend a little less time like watching Netflix at night <laughs> and a little more time cooking for my kids yeah. and eating with my kids and that it doesn't feel like a drag or a sacrifice. It feels like life has been enriched. Climate change, for whatever reason, is not a sticky subject. Like it, It's very hard to maintain care about it. And perhaps that's because, as you were suggesting, it's hard to believe. So in, in We Are the Weather, I tell the story of um, a 20-year-old Catholic in the Polish underground named Jan Karski, who smuggled himself into the Warsaw Ghetto and into an extermination camp, collected te testimonies and evidence, and brought it to the West to try to persuade British and American leaders that they had to intervene. Um, and he had a famous meeting with a U.S. Supreme Court justice named Felix Frankfurter, um, who was Jewish and an extremely smart guy. And Frankfurter heard him out and asked him some questions and then said, I have to be honest, I don't believe what you're telling me. And Karski's colleague said, how can you not believe? You know, Why on earth would this guy have gone to all this trouble to lie to you about this? And Frankfurter said, I didn't say that he was lying. I said that I'm unable to believe him. My mind and my heart were made in such a way that I just can't. I can't believe him. And a lot of people, myself included, have that experience with climate change. We know the scientists are telling the truth. Mm -hmm. We don't think they're lying. We just can't believe the implications of what they're telling us. If we did, you know, we wouldn't be sitting here talking right now. We'd be hysterical. We'd certainly be like fully devoted to working against the future that they've outlined. Mm. Do you think people will read your book and do something about it? Are you hopeful? Because you talk about hope in the book as well. Are you genuinely hopeful that, it, that we will do it? We need lots of books because there are lots of readers mm -hmm. and because readers are, are not the same. You know, some people are reached by, um, you know, uh, Homer. Some people are reached by Henry James. Some people are reached by Thomas Hardy. Um, and it's the same thing with climate change. It is a story that we're telling that people need to be reached by for it to be effective. And so some people are going to be reached by a purely scientific argument. Some people will be reached by a litany of facts. Some people will be reached by a 16-year-old Swedish girl. Some people will be reached by a novelist who's trying to tell the story in a different way. Um, there isn't a right way to tell the story, but there is a wrong way, which is silence. You know, not thinking about it, not um, insisting that it be part of our everyday thought process. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope that I'm adding something, that there will be a reader somewhere who says, you know, this makes sense to me. I hadn't really found a way to engage with the subject before, but this approach makes sense to me.